Coming up on Tech News Today, Netflix is saved from the Amazon outage by a chaos monkey and Rambo. Uh, Amazon tries to explain or figure out what happened. Sony still doesn't know what happened to their network, and it's still down. Facebook re-events email, and an IP address is not your identity. We're going to get into that and more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, April 25th, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle the used gadgets lying around your home or office. Don't just sell it, Gazelle it. For a 5% bonus payment for your used gadgets, go to gazelle.com and use the bonus code TWIT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Darren Kitchen. And I'm Jason Howell. Hey, it's the Monday crew back again. Hey. Welcome back from Hawaii. Hey, I haven't been reading news, so... You look what, quite relaxed. Has anything happened? Thank no. you. I feel relaxed. Yeah. Uh, a lot of lawsuits. Amazon took a vacation oh. while you did as well. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I Sony started that. a vacation and still hasn't come back. Oh, that's nice. Well, I hope they're somewhere good. Yeah, I hope they're relaxing. Me too. Maybe it's all inclusive. I hope so. It's <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> we'll get to those in, in a little bit. Uh, let's start off with the uh, freshest piece of news. Facebook launches a send button for more selective sharing. So next to the like button, you can now on your website put a send button, which allows you, okay, check this out, right? Okay. Nobody's uh, ever ooh. thought of this before. <laughs> if you press this button, uh -huh. a link to the story will be sent to someone you know. So, so, like, so like pasting the link in your address bar in an email to a friend, except... Except with a button. Oh, with a button. And you don't have to you don't have to do any cut and paste. So instead of like Alt D, Control yeah. C, Control One, C, Control V, type the person's name, tab tab enter, mm -hmm. it's just one thing. Or instead of hitting the button that says email to friend uh -huh. uh, and only having to, you know, have a, a blank box that you have to remember the email from, oh, yeah. you press the share button. And you can just type the person's name in their Facebook profile. Get the so this set. is for when you're reading articles on other sites and you happen to be logged into Gmail or not sorry, not Gmail, um, into Facebook. Facebook on another tab or something like that. You don't even have to be logged into Facebook. Yeah, basically up to now, if you were hitting the like button, it would it would put it on your wall and everybody saw it. So this is when you, you, you can't remember somebody's email. You just want to send it to them on Facebook, but you, you don't remember their email and you only want them to see it. It's also, or or you only want uh, you know, everybody in this room. If there was an article that I came across online and I was like, ah, oh, the TNT crew would love this article, but I don't want to spam all my Facebook friends with it or have to explain it or it might be an inside joke or something. I could just send it to all of you either within Facebook or your individual email addresses. And the whole point of that is, is that I can use Facebook basically to email you without having to go over to Gmail or whatever other email client I might be using or have to leave the article that I'm already on. Now, could I send it to a group's wall or will it just go to each person in the group's individual inbox? Uh, that's a good question. I believe if you email, if you, if you, sh if you sent, different from shared, if you sent to a group, it would go onto the group's wall. But again, you don't actually have to visit the group's wall within Facebook to, at, to share a link, which is what you have to do okay. right now. Uh, Facebook groups also got some tweaks as well, right? Yeah. Uh, photo albums uh, can now be uploaded instead of just one picture at a time. Uh, f Facebook questions uh, got added to groups now. Which is really helpful. And uh, one thing that annoyed people right off the bat about groups is anybody can create a group about anything and then add folks. But those folks can then add other folks. And I, I, I don't know, we've told, you and I were probably on the same Facebook group. As soon as groups rolled out, I got added to something called like New Media Professionals. And all of a sudden there were like 3,000 of us and I didn't know anybody. Yeah. And I was getting spammed all the time with messages from people I had never heard of. And, I, you know, it was sort of like it had, it's easy enough for me to remove myself, but um, it can, you can now actually create a group where it's locked down. So it's kind of like a Facebook event where it could be open to everybody, but the admin can be like, this is a group. Uh, I've invited all of you, but we're not going to, you this know, we're, we're going to keep it contained. But it's not a democracy. This is an exclusive group. Yeah. Yes. Only I can choose who joins the group. Yeah. So it's more of an exclusive club. 
yeah. I mean, it just it just gives you more options because Facebook groups. Sometimes you want as many people as possible, and other times that is um, it's not good for anybody. You can also merge groups. So if there's a group that has been active and for whatever reason it's not applicable anymore, or was based around. Uh, I don't know, a date that came and went, you can oh. then roll all those people into a new group. So if I join like a limited time group for a specific event, then a marketing company can roll that into their main site and suck me in. That would be a way that, yes, a marketing group could be smart and keep you on the roster. Looks like there's also integration of Facebook questions, which relaunched last month. Anyone in this room use Facebook questions? I haven't yet. I have. Um, I know that they relaunched. Um, I mean, it's it's a little bit more of a Quora model. Um, yeah. uh, and I, I have to admit that I don't use it regularly. Yeah, neither do I. Facebook it dabbles in pretty much everything. Yeah, they, like, exactly. do, what, what do you want? Facebook does it. Whether or not you use a service is just not but really they have the happened. heart of the matter, but they've got it. Right, and with the send button, it's just further perpetuating the closed system that is yes. Facebook. I mean, them launching basically their own email system not too long ago, trying to kind of keep you in that model. And while it is easier for the users, and think about the 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 internet citizens that are growing up today with Facebook as kind of a de facto thing as opposed to email. Now, we may mock this and be like, why would you do that? Well, you just copy and paste the link and do an email, you know, with that accent. You have to do it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, if you're growing up with this stuff, it just seems like it's just, you know, perpetuating the closed model that is Facebook. I mean, obviously, Facebook has gotten um, a lot of usage out of that like button. You know, at the beginning, it's like, oh, is it Who's really going to use this? Is this is this too Facebook centric? Oh, the walled garden. This is um, it, now. No one even thinks about it. Yeah, it's hitting ubiquitous. the like button is second nature. Uh, every well, not every site, but most sites have it, or else they're missing something, and they'll do the same thing with the with the send button. It's a little work on a site admin's part, but something they got to do. One more button to squeeze in there with your dig yeah. and your stumble upon and, and your Twitter, Twitter and. <laughs> All right, good news for Barnes & Noble Nook e-reader owners as well as uh, prospective e-book shoppers. Uh, Barnes & Noble has now gotten the Nook Color 1.2 software update in the channel. Uh, it brings Android 2.2, a.k.a. Froyo, as well as Flash 10.1 to you and the Barnes & Noble app shop. Nook Color is uh, currently 249 bucks, so this essentially is the cheapest tablet. Well, maybe not the cheapest tablet, but it's a pretty cheap tablet. But it's also a little limited. The, the app shop only has 125 apps at launch. Barnes & Noble says they're really going to curate it very heavily because they're still looking at this as an e-reader that just does some extra stuff, like play Pandora or Angry Birds, because that is the litmus test for whether a tablet is any good or not. Well, that, it's so funny. It's like it's an e-reader that acts like a tablet, but is it an e-reader that acts like a tablet or is it just a cheaper tablet? Well, when it only has 125 apps, maybe that's the distinction. I mean, uh, John Shar, the uh, Barnes & Noble digital newsstand guy, says that, uh, that it's targeted towards people who love reading books. And so they've got to make a distinction between it and a tablet. Obviously, the lower price point is helping. Um, and maybe by having that limited functionality, it you know, makes it more book Focused. But it's also, I mean, you think about e-reader, you know, the concept of e-reader started as you're looking at e-ink on a page, right? The Kindle, for example. So this is still an e-reader, but it, uh, ta uh, it makes better use of the way magazines are supposed to be digested with colors and the way that they're right, laid because out. Because it has flash, so it can, it can integrate all that stuff. Yeah, so I mean, that still sounds... I mean, if I'm reading, if I'm someone who loves to read, I'm not necessarily reading a novel, I'm just reading. Yeah. So an e-reader, to me, I mean, I, I don't think that you go into tablet territory just because uh, you're reading a magazine. Well, well maybe if you're not a power reader, if you're just like a regular reader and you just want to read books, not read books and play Angry Birds, right. then you know, maybe the Kindle is maybe a better fit, less expensive. In, so, in some ways, this is, this is the right thing to do because it gives you some of the entertainment options of a tablet. But if really what you want is an e-reader... Mm -hmm. It's the best of both possible worlds. So you don't have to think about buying two devices. You're like, well, I get a few games like Angry Birds. I'm not that big into it. Uh, and I get to check my email. There's an email client that can do IMAP and POP. Uh, so I don't have to leave my e-reader to check on a few things or to send a thought to somebody in email. And it has a browser, a pretty decent browser. With Flash. So you, can, you can play Flash. You can watch mm -hmm. video. I'm sure Hulu will block it immediately as soon as this <laughs> update uh, is finished rolling out today. 
Uh, it also integrates with Twitter and Facebook so that you can easily find your friends and do the e-lending. Uh, but this is definitely a supercharged ebook reader, okay. in my opinion, uh, with a lot of tablet functionality. It's not a competitor to the iPad or to the Zoom or, or any it's of the It's like others. the modern netbook. I mean, for many people, it's all you really need anyway. So, yes, it's not the r most robust laptop that you can buy. It's not a laptop replacement like some tablets are aiming to be. Do, yeah. do you think that by having this limited selection, a curated selection of 125 apps, makes it easier for those that may kind of like lower the, the barrier to entry and make it easier for somebody that may still think of a, a, something like the iPad or a tablet as, you know, still too computery, still too many choices when all you have is, you know, 125 to choose from? You know, top game is Angry Birds. You know. I don't think you buy this because you wanted a tablet. I think you buy this because it's it gives you more than the other e-readers. Mm -hmm. So you look at the at the Amazon Kindle in the hundred dollar range, but you spend the extra money on the Nook Color because you get more. But I don't think you 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 comparison shop between this and an iPad. No, I don't either. Nintendo is going to make you comparison shop between an Xbox, a PlayStation 3, and a new Nintendo box yet to be named, rumored to be called Project Cafe. But the official line has come out at, during the, uh, well, actually to distract people from their rather disappointing earnings call, uh, Nintendo has decided to launch in 2012, after March, after the first quarter, a system to succeed the Wii. Uh, they'll show a playable model of the new system and announce more specs at E3, which takes place June 7th through June 9th. So we'll be there, Leo Laporte uh, and Brian Brushwood will be down. I think Glenn Rubenstein's going to join them as well. And we'll be covering that to, to let you know as soon as they announce it what is really true about Project Cafe and whether it's even ever been called Project Cafe and, uh, and, and what's not. But Nintendo will be the first out the door with a new console in the next generation. They definitely need to refresh the line because, you know, their margins or their, their profits down, you know, 66% lower than it was last year. So, I mean, that's huge. Yeah, they sold 3.61 million 3DS handhelds, but net profit declined because they're not selling as many Wiis. Uh, the, the Nintendo Wii is still selling, but it's not selling in nearly as large of amount as it should. They do have um, forecast to sell quite a few 3DS units next year, though. Um, I think it goes up to about 14 million um, is projected for next year, up from, well, 3.6 so yeah. far. It's, so I think what they're doing is they're saying, look, 3DS is selling like hotcakes. Yeah. Don't worry about We're us. We got a new our, Wii in yeah. the channel. Mm -hmm. Just don't dump our stock. Right. Everything is going to be just fine. Yeah. We know a direction we have to be going, and we're working on it. I find w what's interesting that I've been reading on, on Slash Gear is the rumor that uh, supposedly the Nintendo 3DS might even be able to be used as a controller for the whatever the next Nintendo box for Whatever be. that Project Cafe, whatever the cafe thing, is, thing yeah. whether it's called a stream or what have you. Now, they did, uh, Satoru Iwata talking to Bloomberg, did say not enough 3D TVs out there. We're not really paying too much attention to the 3D in the console space. In the handheld space, yes, but not in the not in the desktop. What is it? Not a desktop. Yeah, family room. Just, just game console. Yeah. Uh, this episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle. If you want to be able to afford a new Wii or a Barnes & Noble Nook Color or any of these gadgets, you probably need to get rid of some of your old gadgets, and you can do that and make some money the very easiest way possible. Uh, get yourself a new smartphone, a new MP3 player, whatever you want. Uh, all you do is you go to gazelle.com, you put in the name of the device, uh, you put in the specs, what wires you have, what condition it's in. Be honest, they're, they're pretty forgiving about that stuff. They just want to know what they're getting when you sell it. And then it will give you a quote. Now, some things they won't be able to take, but they'll still take them from you and recycle them. Uh, so, so that is a good way to get rid of some gadgets that are really old and maybe not worth anything at all. Uh, but if it's worth something, they'll just pay you. you. You don't have to wait around for it to sell or anything. You, you put it in a box, print out the label, send it to them, or even uh, wait for them. They'll send you a box themselves, and then you can get the check. You, yeah, in fact, you can get a check. You can get PayPal. You can get Amazon. You can get Walmart credit. Uh, or you can ask Gazelle to donate the value of your gadget to charity, if you like, if you're just cleaning out. Uh, either way, you're going to get 5% more than anybody else because you listen to TNT. So use the bonus code TWIT to let them know you heard it right here on the TWIT network. And we thank Gazelle for their support. I still need, I still need to put some new stuff up. Uh, not, you don't put it up on Gazelle. That's the best part. You just, I just need to sell some stuff. It's, so, it's so easy. Yeah. yeah. You have to make room for your, uh, your playbook, right? Yes. Because uh -oh, it takes one, up. one gadget in, another gadget out. <laughs> because it takes so much room. Let's get in the axe. 
Uh, whatever's out on the garage shelf. <laughs> that Motorola Razor doesn't need. Your, I don't need your, that your around Nokia anymore. Your Nokia sixty one hundred. Actually, my iPad one. I should yeah. probably get rid of. Uh, you know, I got um, uh, quite a bit of money back from an iPad one from Gazelle. More than I thought I would. Yeah, nice. We well, used our code, so I'm about to sell my Can't PlayStation do. three, considering the outage. Uh oh. Which was only supposed to be a couple of days. Uh, but now PlayStation Network is saying they don't have any estimate when the PlayStation Network will come back online. Uh, Satoshi Fukuoka, a spokesman for Sony Computer Entertainment, spoke with PC World, claimed the company has not yet determined uh, if the personal information or credit card numbers of users have been compromised. But Sony would promptly inform users if they found that to be the case. It's an external intrusion. They say it's, it's not a bandwidth problem. It's not a web storage problem. It's hackers. Uh, and Sony's James Gallagher in the EU and Patrick Siebold in the U.S. posted identical blog posts uh, that said, unfortunately, they don't have an update on time frame. Uh, and they, are, they say this is a time-intensive process and are working to get P PlayStation Network back online quickly. Essentially, they're rebuilding the system from scratch is what it sounds like. Yeah, Siebold actually also wrote that, he, uh, that they were, you know, uh, that their efforts to resolve the matter involved building the system to further strengthen the network infrastructure. So they're using some of this time to actually beef up security. Yeah, because uh, when a, a hacker intrudes into a network uh, that has been under a lot of scrutiny because mm -hmm. of George Hotz and attacks yep. by Anonymous, which, by the way, Anonymous says, it's not us. We don't love Sony any more than we ever have, but we're not doing this. Yeah, they said, we've entirely lost interest in wasting our time on Sony. Yeah. Although, if you were going to launch a big attack on Sony, you might say something like, we're not even interested in doing this. So <laughs> yeah, that you, you can play you that might... game all day long. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. Uh, but, the, uh, you know, people having various reactions to this, one, they're very happy to see Gallagher and Siebold's updates. Uh, even if they don't say much, they're continuing to update people, unlike... Uh, the, the sort of muted updates we got from Amazon, they're, they're very personal. They're full of as much information as they can. They really? try to save I, time reading, frames when they can. I'm reading quite the opposite. I'm reading that, you know, gamers are, are peeved that they're not getting enough updates and enough, like, kind of, you know, an ETA on when they can play uh, Portal 2 co-op or, or Mortal Kombat. Well, that's the well, other that's side. There, there are people who are satisfied with the updates, and then the other side is like, I want to use this network. Yeah. I, Portal 2 and Mortal Kombat came out, and I can't play it. I mean, sure, it's a free service, but, you know, you, you probably purchased your console based on an assumption that that free service would be up. Yeah. I think that you can be as transparent uh, with your community um, as you want to be. You know, update them f several times an hour if you want, but if there's no ETA on the service being restored... It's still not enough. Yeah, and saying things like we're not sure if your credit card information has been compromised. That's unsettling. Doesn't, it doesn't, yeah, give you a whole lot of confidence. It well, tends ben to irk. Ben Kuchera at Ars Technica had a good suggestion. Uh, that time you're saving, waiting for online play to come back up, you can check your credit card statement and see if there's uh, valid charges. <laughs> yeah. Or as you proposed last Friday, LAN party time. Yes, exactly. Or um, with, with Portal 2 anyway, you've got a Steam code. Mm -hmm. It's time to go uh, install Steam on your on your PC or laptop or if you, you haven't could, already. You know, be a real gamer and play Steam, uh, play Portal Two on a PC. I'm just saying. That's didn't you, didn't you do that over the weekend? Said. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I finished uh, I finished Portal Two over the um, on Saturday. Was it easy? It w I felt like it was quicker yeah. than uh, the original like Portal. It was like... it was less uh, hand eye coordination and more puzzle. Mm, see, oh, I good. think I would like, I like to have that. more, I like yeah. that. actually, because I, I don't have it. good hand-eye coordination. I haven't freed up enough time to play it. Do you guys think we're going to see, like, a post-mortem like we did with RSA, you know, as, as open as they've been with, you know, here's how our network was breached, and this is what was taken? You know, no. Would you expect that from Sony? No. Sony's going to say, it's back up. Enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, we've and, taken oh, the necessary and, oh, precautions to make sure your credit cards are fine. Again. Yeah. There's nothing to see here. Please move along. <laughs> yeah. We might see a postmortem from Amazon, though. They actually did get the uh, service mostly restored on Sunday. Amazon's EC2, if you remember, uh, was down uh, the end of last week. On uh, Sunday at 10.35 p.m. Eastern, they said the vast majority of affected volumes have now been recovered. We're in the process of contacting a limited number of customers who have EBS volumes that have not yet recovered. Uh, a later posting than that said that it was less than 1% of customers who still had an inaccessible volumes. And they said if, you, if we haven't contacted you and you have an inaccessible volume, you should contact EC2 because they're working directly with individuals. Uh, but what we're seeing today is now that it's back up is a lot of articles talking about the sites that relied on EC2 that didn't go down. Uh, in fact, it was spurred by every block posting on their blog, frankly, we screwed up. 
Amazon Web Service explicitly advises that developers should design a site's architecture so that it is resilient to occasional failures and outages, and they didn't do that. Uh, Netflix posted up about how they were able to survive. Netflix never went down, and they rely on EC2. Uh, they have what they call their Rambo architecture. Each system has to be able to succeed no matter what, even on its own, in the jungle, with only a stick and a piece of twine. They can still serve you your movie, because it's the Rambo architecture. Uh, they also have something called the Chaos Monkey. I love this idea. So the, the Chaos Monkey is a script that just randomly shuts down different services to make sure that the whole system can run as a whole with, without those pieces. It's beautifully it. named. Yes. Because that's exactly what it is. It's a little monkey in their processes just shutting stuff down to test it. There's a similar thing on uh, Android. I forget. It's, it's monkey something. I forget. It's not Chaos Monkey, but it's like that. It's actually in the uh, Android documentation where if you invoke this monkey, basically it generates random touches on the screen, and it's what developers used to uh, test their applications as if, you know, what, how would your app respond if you handed it to a monkey? Yeah, <laughs> like me, because we're all <laughs> Tap, tap, monkeys. tap. Tap, tap, tap. It's that thing when, when I'm always uh, impressed when I, like, pick up my iPad without thinking and all of a sudden press a bunch of things and a, and a dialog box pops up. I'm like, wow, they actually designed for that. Smart. Mm -hmm. It's because of that. Uh, also, recovery.gov, uh, run by the government, did not go down. Recovery.gov is a transparency website uh, keeping track of the money from the Recovery and Reinvestment Act. It was unaffected. Uh, Mike Wood, the executive director, explained what they did there. So a lot of companies explaining, hey, here's how we weathered this problem without going down. And it's all about designing for failure. Mm -hmm. You design your architecture so that it doesn't, that the, so that you assume that everything's going to fail and you can stay up. Well, that's the whole, you know, that's what people get scared about when you talk about storing everything in the cloud, right? I mean, cloud services are awesome. But if a cloud service goes down, you can't put all your eggs in the cloud basket. Pardon the Easter pun. It's just, you know, it was just yesterday. But uh, if, that, if that goes down, locally you have to have some sort of plan B yeah. or else... Or a distributed plan. We're going to go to this mm -hmm. other. Uh, so several of these websites talked about how they, they actually had redundant systems. They had other places to go when EC2 went down that they, and, and they that, had backed up volumes. That's also the whole idea of the Amazon cloud, though, is that they've got these you know, five data centers around the world. And then within each data center, there's multiple zones. And in this instance, all of the zones in their northern Virginia facility failed. Right. So, you know, while recovery.gov doesn't comment on where exactly their service is, they say that it is in, you know, uh, the United States. So Other EC2 zones. They didn't even leave right, Amazon. Right. In which case, if it wasn't the northern Virginia one, it was the West Coast one. Because there's only two. Yes. <laughs> there's only two. So they're like, oh, we weren't affected, but we were in the United States. Figure it out. Figure it out. Yeah. Amazon says they're digging deeply into the root cause of this event and will post a detailed postmortem once they have figured it out. I'm sure there's some folks with some good ideas of what happened, but they're not saying yet. Uh, AP has an, a, a scare story up today about three different people having open Wi-Fi access points and getting accused of downloading child porn. A Buffalo man, a Sarasota man, and a Syracuse man all found themselves being raided by either the FBI or police. Uh, some of them thrown on the floor, being called dirty names, mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually convincing the authorities that they didn't do this, that it was somebody accessing their open Wi-Fi. A Wi-Fi Alliance published a survey saying that 32% of internet users have tried to connect to a Wi-Fi network that wasn't theirs. Actually, seems kind of low to me. Uh, I, I just don't... Okay, so these kind of stories are obviously really good reasons um, to put a password on your Wi-Fi network, but I love how it was so hard for somebody to just lock down their Wi-Fi network. But when the, pol or when the FBI comes and knocks down his door, he's like, no, 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 wait, you've got the wrong guy. I don't have a password on my Wi-Fi network, so it couldn't have been me. It was probably one of my neighbors. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't it have been much easier to avoid this altogether by just locking it down? Well, what but what, what about the opposite side? What about the philosophy that says, why should I have to put a password on my network? An IP address is not my identity. That's true. Uh, jumping to that conclusion is going to lead to more of these kinds of incidents where, you know, there you can spoof IPs in various ways. Right. Uh, you can you can break through the password protection. Uh, you can I mean, Darren, you know better than anybody that how easy it is to get past Wi-Fi passwords. Uh, so lot, bad people can do bad things even if you're trying to protect yourself. Or maybe so you want right to now. share 
uh, with the, and, and you're going to risk being punished because you actually want to share your access I'm point with your neighborhood? who loves to take advantage of free Wi-Fi access at a cafe here and there. You I know, mean, and if, and they, and if they were never open, I'm sure I would be very inconvenient. So, yes. And a lot of people say side. that they're, oh, I'm providing Internet access to, to guests, and, you know, I just leave mine open so that anybody walking by can, you know, get, get on. And I feel like if I'm... Uh, doing that, then it's okay for me to do the same when I need to borrow mm -hmm. a cup of Wi-Fi, if you will. I mean, even uh, Bruce Schneier, uh, you know, very um, uh, well-regarded uh, computer security researcher, uh, does the same thing. He leaves his, his network open. He's written, uh, he wrote an essay back in 08 talking about how he feels like it's provi providing internet access. is like providing, you know, heat and electricity or like a cup of tea to your guests. And that he doesn't worry too much about people using his network to send spam or eavesdrop or stuff like that. He says he's more worried about open networks at like airports than he is at some as than somebody sitting outside of his house using his network. Now we ha we have another FBI raid story today as well. Uh, actor and clothing shop owner Wes DeSoto uh, was raided and accused of uploading many movies to Pirate Bay, including The King's Speech, Black Swan, The Fighter, several other films. Uh, based on Oscar screeners, he said, he said when he was busted, I'm nobody in the online file sharing world. This investigation is excessive and a waste of tax dollars. He's also a SAG member, he uh, also which is the Screen Actors Guild, noticed, and apparently had access to he, screen he codes. He didn't deny uploading. No, he just said, uh, you could be doing something else with our taxpayer yeah. money. Didn't now, he, he could have said... Hey, it was, I have an open Wi-Fi access point. It wasn't me. A lot of people do that, hoping to, that leaving their Wi-Fi access points open kind of like indemnifies them against, you know, kind of these, these copyright lawsuits where they can say, hey, you know, you can't prove it was me because I left my access point open. That's the problem with this whole open point issue is that if you say, listen, I don't believe in having a password protected uh, network because I want to be able to help people if they're passing by. Well, someone, is, I mean, you're the one paying for this account, right? And if somebody does something bad on your network and it gets traced back to your network, you have to at least assume that you're going to get a house call. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. and here's the thing. I think Even this, if it DeSoto, wasn't you. this DeSoto case is a good example of why you don't just go on an IP address. Uh, DeSoto is accused of using the Pirate Bay handle M34 Inc. to upload the films. Now, the authorities pinpointed him because the films were uh, were sent out with in the in snail bail with traceable iTunes codes, so that members would then go onto iTunes, download the screener. The screener was also watermarked, and on Pirate Bay MF. 34 Inc. commented back that SAG now sends out iTunes download codes for the screen. I'm a SAG member and thought I'd share these. Uh, a contractor then started looking for anything uploaded from MF34 Inc., nabbed an IP address while it was uploading Rabbit Hole on January 28th. Uh, authorities then subpoenaed Time Warner Cable, got the IP address, but when they obtained the search warrant, they had more than just the IP address. Mm -hmm. They actually had other evidence. The iTunes screener, uh, the fact that MF34 Inc. knew about the iTunes uh, SAG program, the watermark, all of this stuff then builds a case that it's like, okay, it seems likely that you are the guy, yeah. and, and it's not just somebody snarfing your Wi-Fi. And that's going to be a lot more than your typical pirate case, you know, because he's on the inside and obviously wasn't trying very hard to, uh, to keep himself anonymous in that case. Yeah, so I, 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 have, I have to say, and I, I, we have to get away from this idea that an IP address is the be-all and end-all. Uh, it's, it's, it's evidence, and mm -hmm. as you can see with DeSoto's case, it can be used to, to kind of triangulate and narrow down who it is. But, you know, busting in on these poor people and saying, you downloaded child porn just because they have access, I, I find that unconscionable. Right. It shouldn't be against the law to open your Wi-Fi. Yeah, I, I've got, um, there's... An FBI agent and a uh, and a police officer that email me every now and then that are, you know, that deal with this kind of stuff. Always asking for like advice on uh, Wi-Fi stuff, how to like triangulate, say. But they're we're, they're particular look they're particularly looking at actually uh, getting nabbing the the client, nabbing the the person that's connecting to the wireless access point. Not necessarily. They're trying to figure out who the actual perpetrator is. Yeah, they not, don't. Yeah. yeah, they don't care. They're, they're like, we understand he's using a wire, open wireless now. We that's just good. need to you know roam around the neighborhood with the right gear to hopefully get him on our network. You know, run like a like a pineapple or something like this, so we can uh, 
I don't know if that's entrapment or whatever, but... Uh, well, I, I would say, yeah, though, to wrap this up, uh, everyone out there, I recommend you put a password on your Wi-Fi access point unless you really know what you're doing and know what the consequences yeah, are. Yeah, that's what the Wi-Fi Alliance recommends. They, they say WPA2 with a strong password of at least eight characters, no dictionary words. If you've seen any of the stuff with if you uh, really want Patty, you know if, that's... If you really want to share it with friends, write it down on a piece of yeah. paper, keep it in a drawer... In your in your apartment or in your house, and then when friends come over, you can show them the piece of paper and they can log off. Yeah, you don't really have to make it that ridiculous. You don't have to go through the the, the uh, troubles of putting together MAC address filtering and, and and hiding your SSID. As long as you change your SSID and don't use the default Netgear Linksys whatever came with your little plastic right. box, and because uh, that's the uh, the seed for your um, uh, the the way that it. Uh, encrypts it. Anyway, if you change that and just come up with a decent password with some numbers, you're set. Let's, uh, let's wrap it up with a little follow-up from the iPhone tracking story, which has now become the all smartphones track you story. Illinois Attorney General Lisa Madigan says she has sent a letter to Google and Apple asking them to detail exactly what information their devices are collecting, how long the information is stored, and for what purposes. I have a feeling Apple will pull out the letter they sent to Congress uh, about a month ago and send that along to Lisa Madigan. Uh, Apple is also being sued for a privacy invasion and computer fraud by two customers in Florida who claim the company is secretly recording and storing the location and movement of iPhone and iPad users because of this file we talked about last week. Uh, that's been filed in Tampa, Florida. Microsoft came out and said, we don't track you. Uh, we, we don't have anything on Windows Phone 7 that could track you. We don't track anyone. Uh, so we're fine. And Mac Rumors reporting one of these alleged Steve Jobs emails that they say they've looked at the headers, and it's definitely Steve Jobs, according to them, uh, responding to someone saying, hey, do you track me? Because I might be switching to a droid because uh, Google doesn't track people. Steve Jobs writes back, oh, yes, they do. We don't track anyone. The info circulating around is false. It sounds like something Mr. Jobs might yeah. retort back via email. Whether it's true or not, past. though, the, the point remains, we still don't know what that file does mm -hmm. uh, that, is, that is unencrypted on the phone. It it's, doesn't seem to be very damning, uh, but it, does, it, it is an issue that I'd like to hear somebody say, oh, you know what, that's a cache that, should, that isn't being properly cleared and it's mm -hmm. used to improve your cell phone reception. Uh, there have been a lot of good theories over the weekend from different security researchers saying we think this is what it is, but I would like to hear from Apple. Later. It also seems to be missing some stuff. I mean, folks who have been looking at their own oh, yeah. uh, tracking history are like, well, missed the whole part where I went to this town yeah. on Saturday. My, I never have left the Bay Area since I bought that iPhone last summer, according to my iPhone. But you have. But I have. I don't or know. have you? Or maybe dun, it wasn't dun, me. Dun. <laughs> Apple tells the truth. <laughs> Tom Merritt is a replicant. Hurry up. <laughs> on to the news views. <laughs> The tablet space is about to get more cluttered, according to thisismynext.com. That's the Topolsky and Friends website. Uh, Lenovo will roll out a Tegra 2-based tablet that runs Honeycomb. What's different about the tablet? Well, it will come with a stylus. A stylus. For all you stylus fans out there, and I'm not being facetious. I know you exist because you emailed me last time I made fun of styluses. Uh, while it will have a capacitive touchscreen, the stylus is there for sketching and note-taking. The tablet also appears to be dockable to make it more like a laptop. It will either be called the ThinkPad tablet or possibly the Think Slate. In an effort to stop any patent wars from breaking out, Google has announced the new WebM community cross-license where members will, who join will cross-license any WebM-related patents to each other. Sixteen members have joined so far. WebM is Google's codec for audio and video designed for HTML5. And this fights the MPLA, which is creating their own WebM patent. Yeah. So, so now we can have mutually assured destruction, which means nobody will sue each other. I love that idea. That's so good. Uh, Google accepts exec Wael Ghanim, um, who had been running a Facebook fan page central in the Egyptian revolution, will step away from Google. Uh, Ghanim announced in, in, his, uh, in his decision via Twitter, uh, quote, decided to take a long-term sabbatical from Google and start a technology-focused NGO to help fight poverty and foster education in Pound Egypt. Iran is under attack, or so they say. This time, it's the STARS virus. What does it do? It plays you unlimited movies on... No, wait, that's a different virus. Uh, <laughs> according to Iran's civil defense organization, it is capable of inflicting minor damage. Ow! There are a lot of details about STARS. Uh, the last attack on Iran was back when the country was hit by Stuxnet, of, of course. The description of STARS, to me, sounds like 
a virus or possibly a Trojan, uh, which means I think someone in Iran was using email. <laughs> <laughs> Yahoo's just picked up startup Into Now for some, somewhere between about 20 and $30 million. The company makes an iOS app that can listen to TV programs and identify them, and then you can share what you're watching with your friends. So it's like a social network for what you're watching. Yahoo hasn't wasted any time. The Into Now website already has Yahoo branding on it, even though the Into Now app launched only 12 weeks ago. Good work, Yahoo. Somebody knew what yeah. was going on there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're going to love this, Sarah. Storify opens to the public Monday, hoping to help journalists and others collect and filter information from social networks. Yes. Users can select private or publicly available information from like Twitter, Facebook, Flickr, YouTube, other sites like that. And they can add text and embed the resulting collages of content on their own sites. Uh, during a private test period, reporters from the Washington Post, NPR and PBS and other outlets use the service to cover topics like the Egyptian Revolution. A lot of stuff about the Egyptian Revolution today. Some new reports take a look at mobile data. Cisco's global mode of data traffic forecast says that tablets generate five times more data traffic than smartphones and that last year's mobile data traffic was three times the size of the entire Internet in the year 2000. Another report from Goldman Sachs says that by 2020, it expects tablets to account for 17% of all mobile wireless data demand. People like to be connected on the go, and this will definitely be used to raise our rates and lower our caps. You can count on it. Netflix has released their quarterly earnings, and what do you know? Everything was above expectations. Yay. The company has 23.6 million subs. That's up from 14 million a year ago. Revenue was seven, uh, 719 million up, 46% year over year. CEO Reed Hastings has pointed out that content licensing deals amortized over several years have not been draining the budget and indicated the company will try a couple more stabs at original programming. So we might get some more, uh, what was that, Red House, House thing, whatever? Red yeah. House? I don't remember house what it's called. House thing? It's a, the original programming that Netflix has signed up for. Oh, I forget. Yeah. It's coming soon, though. <laughs> totally memorable. It's going to be good. They're all going to watch that, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, it's supposed to be, it looks like it's supposed to be pretty Red good. Red House? Well, I don't know. Anyway. Okay. Uh, the Wakato House Times. Of House of Cards. House of Cards. I knew cards. it had house in it. it that, was the, that was IRC, not me. Thank you. Thank chat you, chat. Uh, the Wakato Times in New Zealand is reporting that someone forgot to tell a computer not to unlock a supermarket on the Friday holiday, they had Good Friday off in New Zealand, about half of 24 people who came into the supermarket still paid for their groceries using the self-checkout service. Well, that's very honest of them. What However, good customers? the service stopped working after alcohol was scanned, which requires a staff member to come over and verify ID. Okay. Did you guys see the quote from the owner, Mr. Miller? who was quoted as saying, I can certainly see the funny side of it, but I'd rather not have the publicity, to be honest. It makes me look like a bit of a dickhead. <laughs> he said, that's what he said, a quote. Yes. <laughs> I could just hear that in a Kiwi accent. That's brilliant. Uh-huh. I, I don't, I he don't... also hopes people will do the right thing and just come in and pay for the stuff they took. Yeah. Well, it's New Zealand. I'm sure they will. In sheep. I, I don't think it makes him look like <laughs> the local currency? what he said it made him look like. I just think it looks like an oversight. Yeah. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> like, yeah. You don't seem like a jerk, dude. You just seem like you'd... Should have looked at it a little bit. Anyway, if you took something from Hamilton's Mill Street Pack and Save, uh, you should really go and pay for it. Yeah, Yeah. or return it. Yeah, if you if it's not spoiled. (laughs) Depending on if it's milk, you should probably just keep it. Just just drink it. If you've drank it, then just go pay for it. Yeah. All right, on to the calendar. The Asus E Pad Transformer is hitting the U.S. Like that. Ow. For three ninety nine tomorrow. That's uh, April twenty sixth. Yeah, it's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt, but in a good way. Uh, I think there's a song. Hurt so good. Hurt so bad. John Mellencamp. Hurt so good. Mm, I think yeah. it's hurt so good. Hurt yeah. so good. Uh, Cloud girlfriend. Woo! Darren loves this one. Tell Cloud all about girlfriend. it. Well, too much. it's gonna help Facebook um, your tell girl. your friends that you have a girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna it's just gonna make it seem really real. I can be have pictures like, like, and some interaction, but you won't actually have to have one at all. It'll be like bot and Anna. It takes all the annoyance out of having a girlfriend, but all of the social stature. Oh, would your girlfriend get jealous though? 
of your virtual bot girlfriend? Of your cloud girlfriend? I don't know. Let's let's let's. I don't think find the out. point is to have both. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Just wanted to make that clear. I think that's the last thing you want is for your have? IRL girlfriend to be jealous of your cloud. imaginary Facebook girlfriend. <laughs> that is defeating the purpose altogether. I have to try it this Unless you're trying to play hard to get. Or, uh, yeah, or, or yeah. that. Head games. Always Never a good time, yeah. especially on Facebook. Uh, that launches on, uh, also tomorrow, the 26th, for anyone who's interested in upsetting their loved ones. Social browser Flock will no longer be supported. We've talked about this before, but this is as of tomorrow, also the 26th. So Get your support in today. Enjoy your can. supported Flock. For one more day. And finally, Sony's Norio Oga passed away on April 23rd at 81 years of age from multiple organ failure. Oha is perhaps best known for driving the development of the compact disc, which Sony first released way back in 1982. Yeah, a lot of people credit him as a co-creator of the compact disc. On to the voicemails. Uh, Sprint and Google Voice united. Uh, you can now use Google Voice as a default on Sprint nice. as of the end of last week. And we have one caller reporting on his experience. Hey, TNC crew. This is Jeff from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I, I was commenting on the Sprint with Google Voice integration. I set that up on Friday when I found out that it happened. And... I found out that even though I had it set to forward to both the computer and the phone, I couldn't get calls on my phone anymore. So I don't know if that's a, a bug that's going on or what, but wanted to let you guys know. Yeah, but probably, not, probably not very satisfactory if uh, you set it up and you don't get calls anymore. We don't know if it's at just one caller's experience. Or, or not. So if, you, if other folks have been trying this out, let us know uh, your, your feedback on it, either by giving us a call, 260-TNT-SHOW, or sending us an email, tnt at twit.tv. First email from Connor who says, Hey, Tom, so this is just to you. I've been watching TNT for the past week or so and other TWID podcasts longer. And on one of your recent podcasts, you guys mentioned the story about Google deleting all of their content on Google Video. I just received this email. I forwarded it below from Google. They state that they're eliminating the April 29th deadline and instead moving all content to YouTube. Google Video users can also make the switch immediately if they wanted to. Now, we talked about this on TNT and complained about it and said, Come on, Google, do the right thing. Just make it automatic to switch to YouTube. Mm -hmm. I said the same thing on KFWB. I do a Monday morning hit on KFWB in L.A. Yeah. Said the same thing. They listened. I don't think I was the only one saying it, though. Well, maybe but they did listen to it. Well you. done, Google, hearing everybody saying, you own YouTube. Why not just transfer the videos to YouTube? It made absolutely no sense that people would, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe they don't check the email address that they have associated with Google Video enough to know that they're going to lose this family video that, you know, they don't have access or, or to Or maybe they else. asked the engineer and he was like, oh, that's going to be like a really long shell script. Are you sure? So, yeah, so they had the public outrage and they went back and said, Frank, right, you, I know you, it's going to be a really long shell script. You got to write that script, script Frank. Yeah, we really need you to write that. Okay, Frank. What do you want Frank for dinner? Like, yeah. What do you want for dinner, Frank? Yeah. We, have have a, we have a freaking want. cafeteria. You can yeah. have anything you want. Really good food. <laughs> Thanks, All right. Frank. Anyway, well done, well done, Google, yeah, for, for changing is, your mind and doing the right thing. Absolutely. Big, big applause to you. Uh, Stacy in Lansing, Michigan says, I just wanted to bring your attention to the official Michigan State Police response to their data extraction device that IAS brought up in episode 225. MSP has stated there are only six of these devices that they use, not in the hands of every officer, as the media sort of made it sound. And they are not allowed to use them on traffic stops. If Michigan had a hands-free law, I could see how the use of them might be good evidence in court. However, since Michigan has no such law, it wouldn't do them any good to use them in traffic stops. I hope this helps clear up some misinformation. Thanks for that, Stacy. Appreciate the, uh, the, the clarification. And that's it for our show. No. Yeah. No. I know. It went so fast. Yeah, it did. It's, it's like you've been back for weeks now. Yeah, you know, I remember the show being so much longer, especially so on Mondays, but to today was really enjoyable. <laughs> that's, that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah. huh. See what a vacation can do. <laughs> it's like a lust for life, renewed. <laughs> all, I Iggy, love you guys. You're Iggy Pop over there. <laughs> yeah, I really am. Just a little younger. Just, uh, quite a bit. Quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, Four you don't years. look a thing like Iggy Pop. That was not my implication. <laughs> Actually, he's in much better shape than I am. No offense, Have you seen Iggy. that guy recently? He's very slim. Yeah. Yeah. Zero body fat. Has been all his life. He's doing well. Darren, uh, what's going on over there at the Hack 5? Oh, the current episode is still the one from um, 
NAB, however, the one that's uh, airing on Wednesday is a really good one. It's got a bunch of spear phishing attack how-to stuff. So if you're into, you know, putting together some nasty Wi-Fi devices and stuff like that, you'll enjoy this one. Iran oh. should probably watch that. <laughs> Iran buys equipment from us. And the FBI. <laughs> and they buy equipment from us as well. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for watching. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, and give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. Try to keep it short. Like, no more than 30 seconds. Might actually get it played on the show. That number is 260-TNT-SHOW. We will see you tomorrow. Chaos Monkey! Chaos Monkey! <laughs> Keeping Netflix up, Chaos Monkey! <laughs>